Hey, John. Jace, my man, how are you? I am doing well, buddy. We've uh, we've had an interesting world lately. Uh huh. You uh, think? We we don't usually do this whole video thing. No, this folks. is new. This is a, this is a different animal. We have faces uh, for podcasts. <laughs> we really, really do. Uh, but you know, we we've been talking a lot about this uh, the COVID nineteen situation. And, you know, a good buddy of ours, Rob Foster, another Office Apps and Services MVP, uh, put together a video. It, it, it's 16 minutes to data where he spent some time. I think it was 19 minutes. Uh, he spent some time putting together a visualization that sort of mapped up to what uh, has been done by, with the Johns Hopkins data in ArcGIS. And mm -hmm. but he wanted to do it in Power BI. And so yeah. he just sat down one day and... Yeah, you know, I think it was last weekend. URL will be right at the bottom for that. Yes, there you go. Um, you know, he, he spent some time and put together uh, this thing that he just wanted to be able to play with with his kids. Um, and he was pulling in a single day's worth of file because what happens is in uh, Johns Hopkins has put together this beautiful visualization. Let me know, share. Let should, me share that out. So yeah, let's let's go ahead and jump I'm over. I'm sure. To Unless you're under a rock, you've probably seen this thing already. But anyway, yeah, here you go. So there you go. So this is the Johns Hopkins data uh, that's being shared out. And this is an ArcGIS visualization, the, the map and everything. And you can slice and dice into this. This is updated more regularly than what we're going to show you because they actually have the data. Um, and what you'll see in the bottom pane is that right there where John's mouse is, the downloadable database is in GitHub. And what yep. it is, is it's a, a series of CSV files. When you drill down, you have to go into the CSEE, -E, uh, you know, COVID-19 data into the daily reports. And here you're going to find a file for each day. Um, and, Starting January 22nd. Yeah, that was the day before Wuhan shut down public transportation. Um, and they've made some changes to this data along the way, the schema, it takes a little bit of work to massage what we're going to show you here in this video. Um, so this video is going to be about data preparation, and then we're going to do a second video that's going to talk about visualization. So if you already have a data set that you are enjoying working with, you can jump straight to that second video that we're going to have posted. But if you want to learn how to manipulate and massage your data set and be able to take some open source data and be able to work with it, this is the video for you. Uh, yeah, we're, 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 we're basically going to uh, replicate, plus a few other things, this, uh, this, this curve here, or this chart with time series. So Rob, as you mentioned, he plotted a single file, a single day. So it was a snapshot of current state, geographically, et cetera, et cetera. But we want to get across this time series of data. Um, and, and one of the challenges to it, I, I, as, as you were speaking, I, I just jumped into one of the one of the files and you can see here here's one of the csv files and it's now broken down there's it really really drills into the us data but you uh what you'll see is that there's a total number uh for 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 the data sets we'll get into it more in in, uh, in the in the power bi desktop but that number is the cumulative total as of that date so our, our data is not you know so many were reported on this day and so many were reported on that day each day represents the total amount ever reported. I just wanted to get that across. Yeah. Um, so, and, and right now you're only seeing some of the data here on the screen. There was, uh, there are more yeah. columns to that. Um, but a couple of, couple of data points to understand. This is an evolving uh, chart that you're seeing on the screen right now. Mm -hmm. uh, up until uh, two days ago, we didn't have this, uh, the daily increase in the confirmed by country. Uh, where you could slice into it, they they had not done that work in yeah, here. You so that was part of why John and I looked at this and wanted to really be able to see some of those things. So now you can actually see that they've given us that. When we started building this all out, that was one of the things we wanted to see. And there's other stuff that we'll show you when we get to the charting side of it. But we wanted a normalized way to get in and do this in with our with our own two hands, so to speak. Not yeah, just take what's given to us. And it's really just a good example of how you can use Power BI to um, just take some publicly available data and do some fairly cool things with it fairly quickly. Yeah. So they they focus on the map, whereas we're going to focus more on some other graphs and charts and stuff like that. But so that's where we are. So let's talk about the problem that we ran into first when we started doing this. Number one, 
the data is a little bit dirty. Schema yep. changes happen, stuff like that. So trying to pull in just a straight CSV was not as easy as... Or all of the CSV. The schemas yeah. are different. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it got a little messy. So there was some, some work that we had to do. Power BI gives us that capability to actually massage the data. Yep. Uh, thing number two, GitHub is not a repo. A GitHub repo is not an endpoint that you can point at with Power BI Desktop uh, in order to be able to just go pull data in. There is a GitHub connector. Yeah. The GitHub connector is for administering for administration of GitHub. It is pull. not for connecting yeah. to a repo and pulling data in. Yeah. So that was fun to figure out. Um, and the last one is once we figured out the way that we were going to do this, there was there's not a, there wasn't an automated way very obvious exactly how to do it. If you're not a developer, it, it took me you know, it didn't take me long, but it took me a little bit of time to realize how to automate all of that. So we'll yeah. talk through that at the end of uh, of the charting uh, section, I believe. Uh, actually, we may be talking about that. Yeah, at the end of That's the charting right, section. Well, I, um, I mean, mm -hmm. so so what what was the plan? So how did we get our data that John's going to work with? So John, before we get to that, was there something else you wanted to add? I was just going to say, I mean, you went out and, and grabbed the files first off. You've got all the GitHub tools. I have them somewhere. I rarely use it. But yeah, you're on top of this stuff. And, you know, truth be told, Jason kind of pushed me into doing this. <laughs> <laughs> well, all, most, most good things happen that way, John, yeah. let's be honest. But uh, you, you used, uh, um, well, well, speak to the tools and where you put the data. So um, first thing that you have to do is, you know, I, I started with GitHub Desktop. Okay, so you go out to the GitHub site, you, you need to have an account. So it's very it's free, simple, go out there, get an account, then you install GitHub Desktop. Uh, GitHub Desktop, you go out and you say, I wanna pull this repo local. And so that's what I did. I pulled it to a local folder on my system. You're right. Now, uh, what I wanted to be able to do is, in order to do the Power BI work that we were gonna play with, I wanted this data, as John's showing you, in SharePoint. Because I wanted to be able to use a method that John, John's going to show you using Power BI Desktop to go and point at a SharePoint folder and pull all of these files together. So I, what I did was I pointed it to a local folder that already was syncing using the OneDrive for Business sync client into SharePoint. Yep. Okay, so I went in, I, I created a, a folder in a SharePoint document library. I told it sync. That uses the OneDrive for Business sync agent. And so now I have... When I pull things from GitHub, it pulls local, that local folder gets synced out to SharePoint, and now I have the location that I'm actually gonna go. And the important, yeah, the important thing to note about that is we wanna have it in SharePoint, not only so that the two of us can share the same data set, but so that it's refreshable through Power BI, because Power BI can connect directly to a SharePoint repository or files in a SharePoint repository without having to go through a local gateway. So it's a lot simpler to run the refresh process in Power BI. And we'll do that at the end here. Yep. And and lastly, there there's a little bit of automation that I did. I wrote a PowerShell script, uh, and then I worked with a good friend of ours, Todd Clint, another off, uh, Office Apps and Services MVP. Uh, who uh, had done some work with automating PowerShell through a Windows scheduled task. I'll walk through that in the other video as a part of automation. Uh, but that's how I do that is every night at 7.15 Central, I run a PowerShell script automatically that goes out and does a git pull, pulls the files local and sends everything out. So it's all nice and automated. I don't have to touch anything anymore. All so right. let's dive in. Let's, uh, let's take a quick pause and let's go ahead and jump over to Power BI Desktop and dive in. Yeah, I'll actually, I'll actually just start in SharePoint because you can see this is the folder um, that we're in that, that Jason has copied. It's literally a mirror of those files in, um, in, in GitHub. And while, while I'm here, I'm just gonna, because we're gonna need this later, I'm just gonna grab the URL to the SharePoint site, all right? So now we're gonna go into Power BI Desktop. So here's Power BI Desktop, pristine Power BI Desktop. We're going to go and hit get data. So I want to pull in all of the data from those CSV files, not just one of them, because I want our data over a time span. So I want to be able to see what the trend was from, in this case, January 22nd up until today. That's, that's basically our goal. So I know I'm pulling from SharePoint, so I'm going to just type in SharePoint in the search bar. And I'm going to be pulling from a SharePoint folder. 
For those who don't know, SharePoint folder is the connector you use when you want to read files in a SharePoint document library. It will retrieve all of the files for a given SharePoint site. So I want to go ahead and connect to that. I have then asked for the URL of the SharePoint site. I know it says SharePoint folder in very big letters at the top of the dialog box. Don't be fooled. It's, it actually wants the URL of the site down here below. And so that's why I copied that just a few minutes ago. Um, and I'll go ahead and click OK. So Jason, if you want to jump in at any point in time and crack wise, please feel free. I'm used to it. Yeah, I, I, I was going to knock on you for not being able to type the word SharePoint correctly, but uh, I didn't care. P, but I, I, I left it alone, buddy. Um, <laughs> all right. Yeah, so that's OK. Now, I'm, I'm just going, this is the same folder, and I'm using OneDrive to replicate the same library. It's our demos library that we use for our presentations and stuff. Uh, and I've drilled right down into the folder. So that's, this is the root uh, COVID-19 data and then the daily reports. You saw me do it in GitHub earlier. Well, this is how it looks on the file system. It's a bunch of CSV files and a couple of other extra files. And wh while I'm here, I'm just going to copy this because this is going to act for me as a bit of a unique identifier. You'll see what I mean here in a second. So what you see here is the fact that the SharePoint folder connector has pulled in everything from that site, all the files we use for our demos. And we don't want all that. So we need to go in here and hit transform data. We always want to hit transform we always data. Want we never just want to load, folks. That's you right. always want to transform. Even if you just come in, you look at it and go, okay, cool, close and apply. It's always best to go ahead and hit transform data just so you know for a fact what you're looking yeah. at is clean. And now we have to find all of the files that we want to pull in. And we want to do this in such a way that as files get added in the future, they'll get pulled in automatically. So we're basically going to pull in the contents of a folder. How do we find the folder? If we go over here to the folder path column. I'm going to just pick the, hit this drop down and say, I'm going to filter out everything, or I'm going to filter out uh, all of the items that have or contains that little unique identifier I was talking about. There's multiple ways you can do this. This is just an easy way to do it. I'm just going to punch in that, that text, click on OK. And now you see there's all those CSV files I was talking about, right? As I scroll uh, up and down, you can see those CSV files. But we also see a couple of files here that we don't want. The README MD doesn't have data in it, and the Git Ignore file doesn't, uh, doesn't have any data in it. And that will screw up our, our import process if we leave them there. So we got to get rid of them. Easiest way to do that, I'm going to sort this column in ascending order. So once it's uh, sorted, we see the Git Ignore at the top and the README at the bottom. So it's a pretty simple matter to come over here to this little icon in the upper left-hand corner. I don't know that it has a name, but it's there. Uh, and I'm going to come down here and just say, I'm going to remove top rows. I'm going to remove the first row from the I'm top. I call that table properties, John. Okay, that works. I don't know if that's what it is, but that's... That's yeah. fair enough. Uh, and then I'm going to remove the bottom number one row. And now you can see that we just have our CSV files. But we have another problem here. And as Jason mentioned before, sometimes they change the schema of these. They've done it a couple of times. The thing that we I've really care four about- so far. Four yeah. times they've changed the schema dramatically. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna pretend they only changed it yesterday because they did change it yesterday in a fairly drastic way that we have to deal with now. Um, usually when they, if they just add things to the schema, it will just bring in the common elements. Uh, last night, literally last night as we're recording this, they went and renamed things and messed with things. And so we've got a little more work uh, that we have to do. But we thought that it would be good to leave this in just uh, so people can see how to deal with it. Yep. So, um, so it was last night. And as we record this, it's on the 23rd. Or, Today yeah, today's the 24th. The, today's the 24th. So it was last night's date. It was the 23rd. And there it is at the bottom. Now, I don't want to just go ahead and delete that. But what I am going to do is come up here and I'm going to filter it out. So I'm going to use, um, sorry, I'm not going to use that column. I'm going to come over here to the date created. And you can see this was created on the 23rd. And I'm going to do a date filter, uh, date time filter. And I'm just going to say, I need everything to be before the 23rd. So I can pick this from a calendar, March 23rd, and I'm going to click OK. Now, here, here's a trick for you folks. Um, for those of you who are just going to get started with this, that date column, the date created, is going to be the day that you start and pull down the files. So a couple of reasons why we're doing it this way, and you may need to do it based upon the name of the file, okay? Um, number one, we, yeah, we, we had the date created 
on the day of, that it was actually downloaded. Uh, so that's okay. But if you notice in the column to the left, you notice how 324 is actually the date modified for 321's you know, CSV file. It's because we opened it today in order to examine. That's why that date, just going date modified wasn't gonna work. So you may actually have to use the name column in order to do what John's doing right now, just yeah. something to be aware of. We've already tested it with date created. So we're gonna use date created for right now. But for you, you may have to do exactly what John's doing and just go and say, you know, the name uh, is, is blah, blah, blah. Yep. Anyway. So cool. So now that we've filtered that out, we've got all of our, uh, all of our data sets prior to yesterday that we wanted to use. But we're also gonna wanna pick up yesterday and anything forward. So here's how we're gonna handle that. I'm gonna come over here to my first query and I'm gonna leave the name query one. You'll see why here in a bit, but I'm gonna leave the name. I'm just gonna go ahead and duplicate that. So I'm gonna do it twice, all right? Uh, it comes up with query one, two. Um, I'm just gonna call it query two for all intents and purposes. All right, change the name. And now I'm gonna come over here. Get rid of the, get rid of the end parenthesis. I, Thought I did, uh, yep. all right, so, okay. So now I'm gonna come over here to my applied steps well, and see this little um, uh, little gear icon beside filtered rows. I'm gonna go ahead and on this one, I'm gonna change this. So instead of saying is before the 23rd, I'm gonna say is after or equal to the 23rd, right? So it's exactly the opposite of the, of the filter we had before. I'm gonna click okay. And now we only have that one element, yesterday's data, but we'll also pick up anything that is applied in the future. Cool? I think that's cool. Yeah, that makes it like a lot easier. If yeah. only they would go through and clean up all the data, but they're not gonna do yes. that. The likelihood yeah. is, is that nobody's gonna take the time to do it. So this is our little hack of being able to do all this. This is dealing with wonky data, and we'll see a little bit more wonky data here in a bit. But uh, let's come up here to our first query now. And so you can see that the data we're seeing here is metadata about the file. And I said, we wanna get the data from the file. We wanna pull that data in. Well, the way we do that is by using the combine button. And the combine button will iterate through every file in this list and pull out the underlying data according to the, the, the type of file. Now you want them all to be, be, to be the same type and you want them all as much as possible to be the same schema which is why we just had to go through what we did. What we did. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit this combine button and you'll, we'll see what happens. It the sees, first thing it's doing is validating that the data right. is good. And it knows it's CSV we're connecting to and it's gonna present me in, uh, some options. We could, pick the, uh, we could pick the character set, we could pick what the uh, delimiter is for this file if this isn't right. And it's showing us an example based on the first 200 rows of data. Uh, of what this data looks like. And it looks pretty good. So I'm gonna go ahead and click OK. And what Power Query does for us, it builds a series of, of functions. You don't need to have uh, worry about how they work. Although I will point out one thing when you're dealing with these. We don't have to today. But we get this transform sample file. That's the first file that it looked at. And if you were to come up here and make changes to your transformations in Power Query here, that will be reflected for every file in that folder that get applied. We, again, we don't need to do that here, so we're not going to, but that's there for you. So I did that for the first query. I now need to do that for our second query. Even though there's only one file there now, there won't be in the future. So I'm gonna go ahead and combine. You can see, yep, we only have one file. That's great. We're gonna do exactly the same thing. Let this finish off, I'm gonna click okay. And we're gonna be left with two tables. I didn't really dwell on our query one, what our query one looks like, so I'll, I'll come back to that here in a second. We're gonna be left with two tables that now have the actual data in it. So here you have province, state, country, region, region last update, et cetera, et cetera. And you have the name of the file. That file name is gonna become important here in, in, in just a few minutes. But one of the things you'll notice, if we, look, if we examine this query, we have province slash state country slash region last space update. And then we come down here to query two. This is our different schema. We have more columns, that's okay, but they have different names. So we have this admin two. I don't know why we have admin two. It should be called city, which is what it is. And this is, this is relevant only to the US data, but we might as well have it right. 
and province underscore state, country underscore region, region last underscore update. All right, so if we, we what we want to do is come up here to query one and change the names of these columns so they match because we're going to no. put these things together. Well, huh? It's important to understand the reason why we're doing this is because what, what we want to do is we want to actually have only one table. Ultimately. That's right. That's a good so point. So what we're going to do here is we're going to append one table to the other. In order to make that happen, the names of the columns have to be the same. And what you'll see in query two, where John was, was there's a lot more columns. So what we're going to do is query two is going to be our base query. And we're going to then append query one to it because as long as the column names are the same, it's actually going to lay them out and put them in the right columns and for where you want to be. Now, the other thing to note here um, is we're, we're, we're not going to mess with the last updated date. John went ahead and pulled in the source name. You'll, you'll see source.name here. We're actually going to use that as our date column because we tried a number of different ways. We spent a couple of, you know, a day and a half trying to play with it, massage the data in order to get, find a way to get the right data in there and do it any other way. This is the best way that we found so far in order to have the date of the actual entry be correct and be able to be usable. So there's gonna be a bunch of manipulation that we're gonna do with that, uh, but that's why sourcecon.name is there and that's really important. We're gonna use that instead of last updated date. Yeah, that, 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 that's right. Because we can say for each combination of uh, country and province uh, and date, the numbers you get will be the numbers for that date. And if you start messing around with that last update, you, you might get the same date with different values and you don't know which one's right. And you don't want to mess with that. Yeah. So the other thing, so we're in that, we're in the first query, the older files, and you'll notice we have confirmed deaths and recovered. And that's all we're going to work with. But if you come down here to query two, we've got a little more data than that confirmed deaths, recovered and active. Now don't really need active because active is quite simply confirmed minus deaths and recovered, right? That's the, the, the ones that are left out. We can do that math later anyway. So I'm not gonna really focus on that. But right now, we wanna get that one table that we can, we can work with. Well, let's go ahead and do that. Power Query gives us the capability of doing that by coming up here and clicking on Append Queries. So let's come down here and we're gonna append queries. Now the two options we pick, if we just append the query, we'll add query one to query two. That's viable, we could do that. I think it's a lot cleaner to add that as a whole new uh, set of queries. So I'm gonna take those two tables, the primary table is query two, that's the thing that's gonna determine our primary schema, and then we're gonna append query one to it. Okay, so I'm gonna click okay. And whammo, we've got all of the data we need in a single table, all right? So we've got this combined key that we could we might use in the future. We're not going to use today. Um, you can see we've uh, our, we don't have a country region and country slash region, which would have happened if we hadn't cleaned up our query one. So this data is kind of almost ready to go. We've got a few more things Scroll to do. Scroll down just a little bit, John. Let's actually see that uh, you know, beyond 323, there is data there. Oh yeah. And one way that we can deal with that, folks, is bottom at the very bottom in Power Query, you'll see the column profiling is based on a thousand rows. Yeah. We actually need to click on that and change it from very, at the very bottom, John. Do we want to wait for it? We <laughs> we we don't have to. I think uh, you know that this is something that you can do. Is we can profile based on the don't do it. Well, you already did it. Oh well. <laughs> So what you can do is you can set that so it looks at the entire data set now. If you keep scrolling, you should start to see yeah. other dates come in. Yeah. And yeah. It's going to take a bit to load. There we go. Off. It's starting already. And we've got so many combinations now, cities and states in, uh, in the U.S., that it's going to predominantly be U.S. because we started off with query one. But we'll see that in the data as we go out. I don't think we want to scroll too far past it. Make sense? Makes sense. All right. So, but what we do want to do, as Jason mentioned, I can't trust last update uh, as, as, a, as a valuable a field. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and just delete it from here. Uh, another thing I want to do is come up here to these source queries, and I'm just going to right click on them and say, this, uh, I'm going to deselect enable load. And what that does is it prevents loading of the data into the data model. So if I had not selected that, we'd actually load the same data into our report three different times. And this way, we only have to have it actually loaded in one time. It saves us on space, performance, refresh time, 
lots of different things. So if you're only using the query to support another query, you don't need to load the data into it. I'm gonna come over here to the append one and I'm gonna call it COVID because this is the table we're actually gonna use. And I do need a date field. The, the file name is a, is a good date field to use for our purposes. So I'm gonna, first of all, come over here. You can see it's a text file right now, right? It just happens to be named in a convenient way with .csv. So I'm gonna right click on, uh, I'm gonna right click on the table header and I'm going to replace the values and I'm just simply gonna replace .csv with nothing. Oh, CSV as in Victor, not B as in Bob. All right, so boom, now we have that, and we still see it's a text field, but it's a simple matter of clicking on that little ABC icon and coming down here and changing it to a date. And now we have it in a, in a date format. Now, if we come over here to country and region, we wanna highlight a couple of issues here. A big one is, you can see here, all we have is US data right now. But if I wanna see all the different countries, I can click ahead, uh, select load more, and we're going to look ahead in the data and see all of the countries that we have, and there they all are. Now, if we come down here, we'll, we should see China, right? Fair enough, China, they There's started China. it. <laughs> it started there. Um, but we also, <laughs> if you scroll down here, if you look at hey, the data. mainland we, China at the very top. Mainland China, what's the difference between the two, Jace? I think they're the same, John. They are the same, and this is a problem. So this is inconsistent data input, and this is one of the ways you'll have to uh, deal with inconsistent data input. So we can right-click on the column, and we'll do the same sort of thing. We're gonna just simply replace values. We're gonna replace mainland China with China. Oh, Xin, that's French. I got, oh, not Chins. All right, there we go, China, uh, good stuff telling you buddy now I know another one we have there's a problem with Korea there is yes. South Korea I can't remember what they all are were so here's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna hit this drop down we're gonna go ahead and load more again give that just a second and the reason why we're seeing it, the US first uh, it's, it's showing only there again is because that first thousand rows were yeah. all us all us they data. added in cities and they broke it all down so the, the file is now rather large for that first one so 323's data that's why it shows that way but john let's you know how, what are you doing here how how did you uh how did you get to this so i did the same thing i just i just hit that the filter icon on the upper right hand corner of the country or region um column and i i just typed into the search bar korea and it's gonna show me all the unique values that have the word Korea in them. Now, so Korea South, Republic of Korea, and South Korea are all the same thing, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna filter on it so I can see what I'm working with. So I I'm only gonna see the three different South Koreas. I guess there's four Koreas altogether here. Notice how North Korea is not reported at all. It's funny. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's kind of interesting. I thought we were going to see, you know, day one, zero, day two, one, day three, zero, day four, one, you know. <laughs> nice, John. <laughs> <laughs> all, all right, right there so, we go. So we can see we have South Korea, and down here we have Republic of Korea and Korea, comma, South. So let's get this cleaned up. I'm going to replace the values again here. I'm going to replace Korea comma south with South Korea. And click OK. And then we just have to do Republic of Korea. So you can see it's been changed there. there Same we go. thing. Replace value. Republic of Korea with South Korea. Korea. Now, an easy way for John to be able to check to see if the, if there's only South Korea left, if we've cleaned everything up, or if there's something else left, is to simply click on the down caret. There we can see there's only South Korea left, so there's nothing left. You don't need to go scrolling through and look for everything. That's the quick cheat on how to make sure that you have all of the ones cleaned up. But uh, we've only filtered down to that. We want the whole world in there. How do we do that? Well, we need to go back and clear the filter by simply deleting the filter rows 
in your uh, applied steps there, John. Exactly. Now, folks, we, we, we tell people to be cautious with these things, but this is when we know that that's something we want to do because we filtered it specifically to be able to see. Now we're going to expand back out and you'll start to see all the US's again that'll show up here. Boom. Now we've, we've, we've done, we've applied our transforms. And if you're following along at home, there are a bunch of countries you need to do this with. The United Kingdom is one, uh, Iran is one, there's the Islamic Vietnam Republic. Vietnam was another, there was Vietnam, a yeah. bunch of different, we're not gonna do all of those at the moment because this is, you know, we don't wanna run too long with the video, but. No, no. So we're, uh, we're, I think this is good enough now. I'm looking at my data types and they're all pretty much correct. We're only gonna work with, again, a few of these confirmed deaths uh, uh, recovered. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I think we're ready to load the data in. I well, think before you do, John, we know that there's one more piece of data in here. We know that there's a bunch of zeros where they should ah, say null. So we really want to go clean that up. So let's go and take all four of those columns confirmed all the way to active. And yeah. let's go ahead and let's do, let's do that replace values from zero. Now, oh, John, you did something that's a cardinal sin, buddy. What did I do? Go ahead and hit cancel because right now you're still above the current step. So, but it doesn't matter right where side, I do this. <laughs> correct, but you always want to add right, steps right. at the end. So let's make sure that we're doing that. Just click on that bottom one, and then let's go ahead and replace values. So you're going to do zero to null. So the reason we do this, just in case anybody's wondering, zero is a valid value. Null means I don't know, so I'm not going to count it. So if you were doing an average, you would count the zero and you would ignore the null. So. That's just good practice. If you don't, if the if the zero is simply because you don't know or haven't been recording, it's probably best to convert that to zero uh, to null. All right, and we're going to go ahead and do that. There, there we, go. we go. Now we're ready to load. I think we're ready to load. Uh, that kind of takes us to the end of this part of the video, does it not? I believe it does. So we're going to go ahead and wrap on this video again. If you want to see uh, what comes next. Go ahead and go over and you can watch our next video, which is going to be all about actually charting the data. Again, thanks to uh, to Rob Foster for getting us started with this. You can go out and check out his video. Again, we'll throw the, his, his in, the, in the links at the bottom. And also thanks to Todd Clint for his help in doing some of the automation. And John, I'll see you in the next video. You know what? 